from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's coming up. K-State's Jeff Whitworth is back with the latest from the crop insect front. He'll discuss the confirmed arrival of sugarcane aphid in Kansas and its potential threat to grain sorghum stands. Jeff offering his advice on the need for treatment, saying that you growers should show some restraint there. Also, Washburn University's Roger McCowan will look at a new tax provision being implemented here in Kansas that will impose a sales tax on commerce conducted in the state by out-of-state retailers. He says that as per previous court rulings on similar provisions, there's a good chance this action will be successfully challenged in court. And later on, with Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, a quick roundup on insects active in our grain, sorghum, and soybean fields around Kansas. Crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension, comes by regularly to keep us informed on those insects and what you producers might do in managing those throughout the rest of the growing season in this case. And Jeff, grain, sorghum, we do have the first confirmed report of sugarcane aphid in the state of Kansas, but you point out that is but one of four aphids that producers may find in their sorghum now. Yes. Good morning, Gary. We are starting to look at sorghum pests now. Lots of times we've had real problems with chinch bugs up to this point in time in sorghum as it struggles to grow, but this year we have not had that many problems. And I say that now somebody's going to call and say, oh, I had lots of problems with them <laughs> right. because there's still chinch bugs around. But the growing conditions have been such that we have not had a lot of problems with them. But a lot of the sorghum has been planted late, and it is just now getting into the whirl and or the boot stage. And we have had the first confirmed reports of the sugarcane aphid from Kansas down around the south central part of the state. And that's not unusual. I mean, every year since 2014, we've had sugarcane aphids blow into the state or migrate into the state. And it's usually about this time of the year, you know, mid to late July, early August. And that's critical because by then, usually we're starting to see quite a few beneficials build up. And that's helped us. The first year we had the sugarcane aphid was in 2014. But it wasn't until like August, September, October that we first detected them in South Central Kansas. They didn't amount to much that at that point in time. But then in 2015, 2016, they simply blew up, and we had real problems with them. And we didn't know all that much about them or how to deal with them. Since then, we've learned quite a bit, I hope, mm -hmm. I think, about the sugarcane aphid. They can be confused with some of the other aphids we have in sorghum. We normally have four different species of aphids that will do well in sorghum. And the first one are the green bugs. The green bugs are usually the ones that get on wheat early on, and when the sorghum comes up, they move over into sorghum. And back in the 60s and the 70s and 80s, we had lots of problems with green bugs. But since then, we've learned how to manage green bugs, plus we have resistant varieties. The uh, second one I'll, I'll call the, the yellow-spotted aphid because those are always around. Sometimes they do get confused with uh, the sugarcane aphid just because they're kind of a yellow aphid. They're pretty small, but they've not ever yet, I should say, built up into colonies that we've had to worry about, that we've had to treat. But there's always a few of them around. And that's important because they're also available for a beneficials to build up on. And then the third one is the corn leaf aphid. The corn leaf aphid uh, over the last month 
We've seen quite a few of them in corn, and usually it's about the world stage when we notice them. But then they'll move over into sorghum, and sorghum is where they really sometimes cause concern because they'll build up so much in the world stage, or just as that head starts to come out of the world into the boot stage, they produce so much honeydew, and it's so sticky that that head can't get up out of the world. Mm. Fortunately, it's usually not a field-wide problem. It's just a spot here or a spot there or a few plants. Again, the cornleaf aphid, they can be very highly visible because they produce so much uh, honeydew, and it's sticky and shiny, and a lot of guys confuse that with the sugarcane aphid. Uh, but you need to go over and look at them. They're, they're different colored. They're dark bluish gray, and they're totally different from the sugarcane aphid. But the nice thing about those also is they can be a host for beneficials. So right now we got green bugs, we got yellow spotted aphids, and we have corn leaf aphids all out there providing food for our beneficials. And some of the sorghum fields I've seen have quite a few beneficials. By that I mean the lady beetles and the green lace wings and a lot of the parasitoids, little parasitic wasps are great at finding these colonies. Matter of fact, when I go out looking for sugarcane aphid colonies, the first thing I look for are swarms of surfed flies or beneficials because they're great at finding the aphids before I do when they're when they're real small. It remains to be seen, but right now there's quite a few beneficials out there helping and I have not seen probably 50 highway south is where the the last report I got on the sugarcane aphids is not north of there yet, at least that anybody's found. So as far as management is concerned here, producers should let those beneficials do their work before responding at all with a treatment at this juncture? Yes, uh, and that's one of the problems we have in the last couple of years is in the last month or two, we've had considerable numbers of ragworms, which means they're in the corn and or sorghum during the world stage, feeding on the leaves as the leaves unfurl. We've been through that before as they unfurl. Uh, They leave those leaves very ragged looking. And for the most part, those are fall armyworms, armyworms, and corn earworms. And there's a lot of them. And right now, I just was out last Thursday and Friday and, and found pupae. So they're pupating in the soil. So another week or 10 days, those larvae that have pupated are going to be coming out as adult moths, and they're going to be mating and laying eggs. I think there's going to be another pretty good infestation of corn earworms, fall armyworms, armyworms. It's going to coincide just about when the sorghum is starting to head out. Those worms then that were called ragworms, when they get into the sorghum head, they're called headworms. It's the same thing, but they can do a number on the head. And the the rule of thumb is 5% loss per worm per head. So it's relatively easy. You know, you get out and figure out what your infestation level is, 50% or 100%. It's relatively easy to figure what your projected losses are if you do not treat those larvae. Uh, but then you add in on top that we may have sugarcane aphids, and if you treat for headworms, you're going to decimate the beneficials. You're going to do a good job of controlling, killing, all of the lady beetles, the green lacewings, the surfed flies. You're just going to wipe out the beneficials. That may help provide control for sugarcane aphids. So it's a balancing act, it sounds, Well, Jeff. the problem is... You can go out and detect or determine your infestation level for headworms now. So that's that's a given. That You can figure that right now. We don't know if we're going to have sugarcane aphids or not. You know, once you get them, if, if, the, if your sorghum hasn't headed out yet and you don't have headworms, there are some products that are very easy on beneficials that we recommend if you're just spraying for aphids. But they don't help if you're spraying for headworms or other things. They're just really good for controlling the aphids. So if you do have a headworm problem, you do decide to treat, by all means, you need to treat. But also go back seven days or 10 days or two weeks later, be sure and look at the label and don't enter the field any earlier than the label specifies the reentry interval. But go back out and start checking for colonies of the aphids because if you do spray for headworms, you're not going to get any help 
from these beneficial insects um, to help control these aphids if they do come in. I'm not saying they're going to. I'm not saying if they do get here, if they're going to establish. You know, that's still to be seen, but that's something to think about right now. That's the word for you grain sorghum producers on your insect management currently. Slip in a word here about soybeans and a collection of insects, some of which you've been tracking already and others that may be late arrivals. Producers need to be aware of these, too. Yes, uh, I've gotten a lot of calls in the last week about soybean pests, mostly defoliators. Right now, we're kind of in between also the thistle caterpillars, the webworms, the yellow-striped armyworms. They're just starting to feed as small larvae, so some of the guys are just starting to notice them. Fortunately, most of the canopies, most of the there's enough leaf material out there that I don't think the thistle caterpillars or the webworms are going to affect the soybeans. And as they get into the reproductive stages, they can accept maybe 20 to 30 percent defoliation, and it's not going to affect them. But you need to keep an eye on that because. There's going to be another generation, at least, of uh, webworms and yellow-striped armyworms and armyworms and all these things. So keep that in mind. Now, another thing, we every year since 2002, we've gotten soybean aphids. Mm-hmm. Soybean aphids, uh, in those intervening years, we've had to treat twice around the state that I know about. So if the soybean aphids do establish, it means it's a cooler than normal summer. They can't stand temperatures much more than 85 or 90 degrees uh, during the day. So if we start getting cool, cloudy days for the rest of the summer, the soybean aphids will be here. They migrate in every year. Again, the easiest way to find those is if you see ants crawling in the canopy, crawling on the leaves, where ants don't normally crawl or where you don't normally see them. That means you have soybean aphids someplace. So it's just a matter of finding the colony because... The ants are tending the colony themselves for the honeydew. They actually protect the aphids, and they utilize the honeydew uh, for themselves. Good update, as always. Jeff, thanks for stopping by. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, with advice for you growers on responding to that insect pressure. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back with more shortly here on the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.com. .ksu.edu Next up for you on this Agriculture Today, our regular get-together on key developments in the field of agricultural law and taxation and featuring a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan. Roger, today an item that has arisen here in the state of Kansas, it's proposed by the Kansas Department of Revenue. It is relating to the taxation of commercial sales within a state by a seller which does not have a physical presence in the state. And there is a considerable case history behind this whole premise, is there not? There is. Uh, This is an issue that has been all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, with the Supreme Court rendering a significant decision near the end of its 2018 term, so in late June of 2018, involving a case coming from South Dakota. That case is known as the Wayfair decision, and it involves the issue of when and to what extent a state can tax a remote seller, and that's one that doesn't have a physical presence in the state. At the genesis of a great deal of what we'll talk about today, something called the Commerce Clause. That's a basic legal tenet out there. You might remind us of what that is. Well, way back in 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court determined that the Commerce Clause grants exclusive authority to Congress to regulate trade between the states. And in that case, they held that Illinois could not subject a mail order seller located in Missouri to use tax where the seller had no physical presence in Illinois. That's known as the National Bellis Haas case. And that really kind of 
laid out what the rules were for states to follow in taxing businesses and people that didn't have any physical presence in the state. They didn't have a brick and mortar building in the state, but yet engaged in transactions in the state that generated revenue. And so in that case, the court said that the Illinois law was unconstitutional, reasoning that subjecting the seller's interstate business to local variations in rates of tax and record-keeping requirements would violate the purpose of the Commerce Clause, and that purpose is to ensure a national economy free from unjustifiable local entanglements. Now, when you dig deeper on that, think about all of the different taxing rules, Eric, that are set up all across the country at the county and then at the city and or municipal level. There are literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these. And so what the Supreme Court was saying is, look, state, when you tax somebody that doesn't have a physical presence in your state, I'm subjecting them to sales and use tax and making them keep track of all of these different rules that are at the not only the state, but at the county level the, and the municipal level, at the local level, down to its very core at the local level, that is a huge administrative burden that violates the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause was reaffirmed in a case, well, some quarter century later. Basically, the same principles were considered here? Yeah, that's that in 1992, you're referring to the Quill case that came out of North Dakota and And that involved a mail order house that had no physical presence in North Dakota. They were not subject, uh, the court said, to North Dakota use tax for property purchased for storage use or consumption in the state of North Dakota. And they followed, the Supreme Court in 1992 followed their decision back in 1967 in the National Bell Hess case. But keep in mind, Quill predated the Internet. Mm -hmm. And that, when the Internet came along and the sales with it, that really uh, cast a bit of a different light on the ability of uh, interstate commerce to occur and and, uh, bringing up these potential tax questions once again. Let's jump forward then, if we might, Roger, to this ruling on a law which was passed in the state of South Dakota. And uh, this ruling took place last year. This really established more of a framework on uh, how this is being considered by the courts, right? It sure did. And and the South Dakota legislature passed this legislation on purpose to try to get a case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court to see if they would overturn Quill in light of the way e-commerce has developed, uh, which was not in existence in 1992. And so they had a a piece of legislation that uh, was signed into law in, in early 2016, and it allowed the state to tax remote sellers. And I'm not, I'm not talking income tax. I'm talking this is all sales and use tax. So that's, there's a difference. Mm-hmm. We may get to that in a moment. Department of Revenue in South Dakota started, as soon as the law was passed, sending out notices to sellers that it thought were in violation of state law. And this case uh, wound its way all the way. You know, we had some out-of-state sellers that challenged the law, and, and which is what the legislature was hoping would happen. Somebody challenged it. The case proceeds all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court, as I mentioned earlier, in uh, late June of 2018, right near the end of their 2018 term, they what they said was uh, that you don't have to have a physical presence in the state to be subject to sales and use tax in the state. The other requirements of the National Bellis Hess case in 1967 involving what the court said was a substantial nexus requirement still remain. And explain that if you would. Yeah, that's the whole key to all of this. Uh, They said that this goes back to another case in 1977, elaborating on National Bellis Hess case, where they said there in 1977, again, the U.S. Supreme Court said a state tax would be upheld if it applied to an activity having a substantial nexus with the state was fairly apportioned, did not discriminate against interstate commerce, and was fairly related to the services that the state provided. That last one is really the key. The only thing that the Supreme Court said last year was of those tests, the substantial nexus test need not be satisfied by physical presence, which is what they said was the requirement in 1992 in the Quill case, which, again, predated the Internet. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Internet came along, they said, oh, there's a new way to satisfy substantial nexus. You still have to satisfy it, but there's a new way, and that new way is e-commerce. 
that doesn't mean that the other three requirements were eliminated. No, the Supreme Court kept those in place. In other words, the tax has to be fairly apportioned. It must not discriminate against interstate commerce. And I think this is the key going forward. It must be fairly related to the services that the state provided. And in that South Dakota case last year, the Supreme Court said, since the state of South Dakota placed a requirement on the state to make sure that an out-of-state seller had at least a minimum dollar amount of sales in the state, $100,000, or a minimum number of transactions, that satisfied the requirement that the state's services were fairly related to what the seller was benefiting from by conducting activity in the, in the state, and it met the other requirements, including substantial nexus, that were still in place. But it is, Roger, you say in your write-up on this matter, that minimum threshold of business, so to say, by a seller within a state that is at the core of what we'll talk about now, and that is the new action here in the state of Kansas regarding uh, sales tax on these out-of-state entities. Yeah, that's right. Just a few days ago, it was dated August 1, that the Kansas Department of Revenue put a notice out, and they said this is designed to provide guidance to remote sellers that do business in Kansas. To their credit, and I would say they are correct with respect to this, the Department of Revenue noted that Kansas law defines a retailer that does business in a way that is pretty broad, under the provisions of the Constitution and the law of the United States. Okay. Now, the Department of Revenue, in their notice, said that Kansas requires online and other remote sellers that don't have a physical presence in the state to collect and remit the applicable, and I would put that in quotes, applicable sales and use tax on sales delivered into Kansas. And they have to register and do this by October 1 of this year. I think that's correct. The state can require a remote seller to register with the state and collect and remit sales or use tax, again, under the provisions of the Constitution and the laws of the United States. That means as the applicable law has been defined by the U.S. Supreme Court, which kicks us back to last year's Wayfair decision. Mm -hmm. And that law that the Supreme Court was construing contained a de minimis requirement based on the amount of sales and number of transactions. Now, the Department of Revenue in their notice did not say, we're taking the position that every single dollar of transactions conducted by an out-of-state seller is subject to tax, but it was in a separate news report quoting the director of research at Department of Revenue that says, we believe we have the authority to tax every single dollar, and if the legislature wants to change that, they can't. No, I would take issue with that. That's not a proper construction of what the U.S. Supreme Court said last year. And this is why you think that the new Kansas provision might well be ripe for a challenge in court. I think you can almost guarantee it. There's not too many things that are certain in life. Death is one of those. Taxes is one of those. And I think the state of Kansas is getting sued over this position. If they keep this position and the legislature does not come up with a bill that the governor will sign that puts the thresholds in that kind of mirror what South Dakota did, I think it's almost a dead certainty that the state's going to get sued. Well, there's considerable agriculture-oriented commerce conducted with uh, out-of-state businesses, sellers, retailers, so this certainly has relevance to our industry here in the state. And Have a look at the full write-up on what's happened here in Roger's blog on the website, www.washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. And Roger, we appreciate the insight on this. Many thanks, and we'll talk again in two weeks. Thank you, Eric. Roger McCohen is a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. He's along with us regularly here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And for you now, today's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTN. President Trump indicated back on Friday as he signed that deal to expand U.S. beef exports to the European Union that he could deploy more farmer trade aid. Well, on Twitter this morning, the president said even more specifically that that aid could come again in 2020, tweeting, quoting here, as they have learned in the last two years, American farmers know that China will not be able to hurt them and that their president has stood with them and done what no other president would do. And I'll do it again next year if necessary. That's how the tweet read. Meantime, that beef export agreement with the EU, while a positive move, needs to be kept in perspective, according to a USDA economist. USDA's Gary Crawford has more. With this announcement, we take one more step. President Trump last Friday announcing that agreement that would increase U.S. beef's access to the European market by a large percentage, possibly almost 300 percent in seven years. But, of course, in the overall scheme of things... Beef sales to the EU are a very small portion of our overall exports. USDA trade economist Cameron Doherty says total U.S. beef exports to all countries during the first nine months of this fiscal year are at about $2.2 billion. That's billion with a B. And for the EU, we're at 31.5 million pounds, down 6 million pounds from fiscal year 2018. So he says that the new agreement is ratified by the EU member countries, and if it does add the expected 77 million pounds a year to U.S. hormone-free beef exports to the EU, those exports would still amount to a tiny percentage of the 3 billion-plus pounds of total U.S. beef exports. But cattle producers say, of course, it's a step in the right direction. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Appearing at a meeting in North Carolina, USDA Undersecretary Bill Northey provided some updates on the Market Facilitation Program 2 payments and the coming Supplemental Disaster Program, noting that the payouts for MFP2 would come at the end of August and in September for disaster aid. He said some disaster aid provisions still have to be approved by the Office of Management and Budget. Northey noted there would be what he called a top-up of small support for prevent planted acres in the coming disaster aid provisions, including some aid for stored grain damaged by floods. Northey said this year could be characterized by being a challenging production year and a challenging marketing year. On trade policy matters, he said, quoting him, we are around the corner from good news on a trade deal with Japan, listing that country as a very good market without drama, in his words. He said the president and USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue know that producers have, again quoting, chewed up a lot of equity and that both are determined to assist the agricultural sector. Now, the campaign called Tariffs Hurt the Heartland, comprised of 150 of the larger trade organizations and agricultural commodity groups, today called on the U.S. and China to return to the negotiating table as the economic fallout from the escalated trade war continues to grow. A study commissioned by Tariffs Hurt the Heartland and prepared by the Trade Partnership Worldwide found that if tariffs of 25% are imposed on all remaining imports from China and retaliation follows, the U.S. economy could lose more than 2 million jobs over the next few years. The average family of four would face more than $2,000 in higher costs annually, and the value of the U.S. GDP would drop by 1%. This analysis included the impact of the previously implemented tariffs. A Kansas cattle business is being highlighted as part of a national program that showcases stewardship and conservation in the beef industry. Todd Domer tells us here that the ranchers nominated have experience in land rehabilitation. The Blue Partnership of Castleton has been named one of seven regional finalists for the Environmental Stewardship Award. Brothers C.J. and Russell Blue operate the cow-calf business, which owns and leases land in Reno, Chase, and Barber counties. Regional winners will compete for the national award, which will be announced early next year during the cattle industry convention in San Antonio. The Blues take pride in being land rehabilitation specialists. 
Grass production and grazing capacity on the Barber County Ranch were greatly enhanced when the Blues installed an improved water distribution system and cross-fencing, as well as conducting an aggressive cedar tree control project. Their efforts to reduce the estimated 23 to 40 percent cedar canopy were expedited when the Anderson Creek wildfire went through the ranch in 2016. With the devastation came benefits as streams and springs that had dried up due to water consumption by the cedars began to flow again and native grasses were restored. Since then, they have conducted prescribed burns on different two to three thousand acre sections of the ranch each year. Sustainability is the driving force behind the strategy used to manage the family's cow herd and land resources. The Environmental Stewardship Award was established in 1991 by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I'm Todd Domer. And a team of researchers here at Kansas State University are readying to launch a study on low lignin alfalfa. Agronomist Dohan Ming is leading a team from K-State and the University of Nebraska, which recently received $500,000 from the USDA's National Institute for Food and Agriculture to test growing conditions and conduct feeding trials with low lignin alfalfa. Lignin, as you know, the component that gives strength to the alfalfa plant, but it does limit digestion in cattle and other ruminant animals. Animal performance, especially for milk and meat, is heavily related to digestibility, according to Doe. Hong. That is why it's so critical to lower the lignin content in alfalfa. In the past, as alfalfa has started to bloom, the flowering stage, the forage quality starts to go down dramatically, he says. This new trait of low lignin alfalfa can maintain the nutritive value for 7 to 10 days after blossoming, increasing the biomass available for feed. Another cooperator on this project, K-State agronomist Krishna Jagadish, he'll be growing the low lignin alfalfa varieties under rain shelters where the amount of moisture the plant receives can be controlled. And K-State animal scientist Barry Bradford is on this team. He is tasked with proving the nutritional value of low lignin alfalfa to cattle. They'll be feeding uh, Holsteins and Jerseys initially to determine if low lignin alfalfa has an impact on diet digestibility or yields of milk, milk fat, and milk protein. It's going to be a very interesting research project indeed, and we hope to have Krishna, Dohong, and Barry on board to talk more about it in a future broadcast right here. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. This is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. We watched it all happen several weeks ago when I noticed the first wren activity of looking around, investigating. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Early in the morning, I hear the call. It's like a clear bell ringing over and over again. I'm amazed that such a small bird has that capacity. It's a cheerful note with a tinge of anxiety. I wonder if the anxiety is a warning or a notice to please go away. We will be sitting on the deck while it is still cool and pleasant. He or she is calling. The calling gets closer and closer and then it stops as I observe the small bird with its turned-up tail feathers as he hops from branch to branch in the tree near the deck. No longer calling, it now hops below the railing and carefully flits behind the chairs, standing to the side. Then, momentarily, it sits on the back of the chair and from there flies to the close-by hanging petunia plant. 
then it's gone, disappeared among the large plants' green leaves. Others hear the chicks chirp as the parent enters with a mouthful of food. It's the wren who has built a nest in a hanging planter filled with petunias. We watched it all happen several weeks ago when I noticed the first wren activity of looking around, investigating. He hopped all over near the hanging plant, clung to the brick wall, then started to bring twigs and small leaves. All the while, we quietly sat close by. He ignored us. Later, when the female helped him after she had chosen and accepted this location as the nest by bringing the softer material to line the small nest. She would lay eggs in a finished nest. I expect this to be the second brood for the wren pair. At one time, I counted four eggs. Then later, when I watched the parents' birds busy with mouthful of food, I again carefully turned the hanging basket and looked into the deep nest. I saw tiny pinkies, yellow open beaks. I did not hear the chirping. I think the parent birds are used to us as we do not interfere. They may be irritated, but they go their way as they are caring for the young. It surely keeps them busy. After 16 or 17 days, the young will leave the nest. And being the second brood, I expect that this is it for this year. One should feel very lucky when nature shares this much and more. That takes me to the other nest that I know of and watch the growing chicks in. That brood is the two vulture chicks in the old pony stable near the old stone wall. The vultures were back this spring, circling the sky on updrafts over our hill. Then one day I noticed two large eggs again in the same corner on the ground of the barn as the other years. This is the third year we have chicks. Last year, both chicks died. This year, like the first year, the chicks have grown into sturdy young birds, which I expect will soon start to test their wings. Right now, when I carefully look into the barn, they start to huff and puff. They hiss at me with open beaks. No need to get close. They stink. Their parents must be very busy bringing food. Roadkill. I have not seen them drift and float lately. I expect to see that again when the chicks can fly. They'll start by hopping on the half barn door. It's a Dutch door. I always liked it when the horses stuck their heads out, impatient at times to be let out. Once the birds have mastered hopping onto the half door, they will hop onto the corral fence and move along it. Then, when they feel strong enough and courageous, they will fly up to the higher branches. From there, I think they feel strong enough to get on with life and start doing what their parents do. Near the end of August, they will start to fly south, where the winters are warmer and roadkill is not frozen hard. The wrens go south where the insects will be more abundant and feeding won't be a problem. Wrens and vultures, both birds, but the growing up takes a lot longer for the vulture. Soon, the fletching wrens will leave their nest. They will stay and follow their parents. But from now on, we won't hear their warbling call. They tend to move quietly through the underbrush, of which we have plenty here on the hill. Once the vultures leave the nest or their hiding place, they will start to soar and drift like their parents do. They are impressive birds swooping through the open sky where they use it as home and territory. The wren keeps more restricted to roughly an acre, which 
they will call their territory and defend against other ends. At nest building time, they may trespass into other ends' territory and even steal some of their early nesting materials, a short stick here or there, rather sneaky for such a small bird. As for the vulture, there's not much to steal from the nest. Vultures don't build an intricate nest. All I've seen is a slightly scratched corner on the floor of the barn, and that is where the two eggs were deposited, with an attitude of, who cares? But they too care for their two young fledglings. However, it takes much longer for the large birds to mature and leave the nesting place. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That's our time for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.